2 Chronicles chapter 31, please. 2 Chronicles chapter 31. This passage talks about King Hezekiah, where he is cleansing the temple, preparing the temple, uh, having the priesthood reorganized and managed where they can serve the Lord. However, they came from a bad time where Israel has been used to apostatizing. The temple has been corrupted. The people have been tainted with idolatry and sin. So Hezekiah had to do something to encourage his people back into serving the Lord. I see not much difference with this wicked area, how we can be tainted, how we can be let down. Some of you are going through something in your life, but these things can be conquered through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think what we need more than ever is that we would encourage each other from our broken states and to be able to keep serving God. I want you to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 31. <clears throat> The Bible says in verse 4, Moreover, he commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey. And of all the increase of the field and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. And concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep and the tithe of holy things which were consecrated unto the Lord their God and laid them by heaps. In the third month, they began to lay the foundation of the heaps and finish them in the seventh month. And when Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Then Hezekiah questioned with the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat. And have left plenty, for the Lord hath blessed his people, and that which is left is this great store. Then Hezekiah commanded to prepare chambers in the house of the Lord, and they prepared them, and brought in the offerings and the tithes and the dedicated things faithfully, over which Coniah the Levite was ruler, and Shimei his brother was the next. And Jehiel, and Azaziah, and Nahath, and Asahel, and Jeremoth, and Jezebad, and Eliel, and Ismachiah, and Mahath, and Beniah were overseers under the hand of Kaniah, and Shimei his brother, at the commandment of Hezekiah the king, and Azariah the ruler of the house of God. And 14 through 21 will give you more names mentioned. So... If you recall in this story, notice that the Jews, that they were able to give an abundance of supplies. They were able to rally up the spirit and the entire nation to serve the Lord. They come from a broken state, recall, of apostasy. As a matter of fact, Sennacherib is not just uh, far up ahead. He's able to come into the scene and cause a new trial, new struggle, persecution to the Jews. But the Jews during this time were able, they were able to conquer things. They were able to rally themselves. They were able to stir up their spirits. They were able to give so much to God's ministry. Now the question is, how were they able to do that? How were they able to do that? That's a lot of work. That's a lot of spirit and energy and power. Don't you want something like that, especially in this broken area that we live in? Broken state of apostasy. A Sennacherib that's just at the very next corner that we don't know about. And we come from a, uh, we've come from much corruption and taint from the world. So it is very hard to rally our spirits to be able to serve the Lord. So how are we able to do it? The verse says in verse 4, Give the portion of the priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. It's because I believe they were given something to encourage themselves to serve God. I wonder if us, if we were to give something, a portion, 
just a portion to each other, how much more so can we be encouraged to keep fighting on, to live another day, to survive another week, to go through another month, to stay clean, to pick ourselves back up and serve God. How much more so if we would give just a portion, a portion, but so much more. The title of my message is Give it all, uh, give them all you got. Give them all you got. Let's pray. Uh, Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing blood to preach what you want me to preach. I preach completely in weakness and just doing the same usual thing. Uh, but this is new and uh, this can be fresh. Uh, you can make it that way, Lord. So will you fill uh, within me and use me? That's all I can pray, Lord. Uh, use my broken state to minister to these people, for Jesus Christ must be manifested and lifted up. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. <clears throat> now, I want you to look at the first point at verse 4. Moreover, he commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the Levites. Notice that the command is given not to the cities of Judah first. Now, there are many cities that he could uh, summon or ask. He can ask Beersheba, for example. He can ask other cities in Judah. He could ask uh, Hebron, a city of refuge. But he asked Jerusalem first to give the portion of the priests and the Levites. Notice that passage is mentioned right there at verse 4. And then if you look at verse... 6, it's uh, verse 5, and as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought, then it goes to verse 6, and concerning the children in is, uh, of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the plural cities of Judah, they also brought in. Notice verse 6, the remaining cities were able to come in and join in the encouragement, they were encouraged to give the portion to God's people, which are the priests here, because Jerusalem went first. I always wondered, and I try to figure out, why Jerusalem first? Why Jerusalem first? Why not, again, Beersheba? Beersheba means uh, seven wells. Could it mean that seven is a good number? And wells is a refreshing water from the Lord. So wouldn't that be a good place? Why not Hebron? That is the city of refuge. During this time, they're in a broken state and they could flee to God, their refuge. Why not Hebron? Why is it Jerusalem? I wonder what it means. It means city of peace. Well, I don't know the reason why you and I can never understand everything in that book or why God would choose a specific city or a specific group of people to do it first. We'll never understand the details. We can keep figuring out in our heads why, why, why. Maybe the Lord did it because of this. Maybe the Lord did it because of that. But I think the bottom line is we should stop figuring out why or what and if we cannot figure it out and just know that the city of peace is connected to those who give the portion to God's people so that they can be encouraged in the law of the Lord. Okay. So in other words, if you are in that city of peace, my friend, bottom line is this, then you'll be able to give to others and encourage them to keep serving God. You know, a lot of times we try to figure out and come up with reasons. Uh, why, Lord, do we do it this way? Why, Lord, that way? It's hard to keep serving you. Uh, God, I can't take it anymore. You know, you can rack your brain and keep figuring out why, 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 but you'll never really understand. But just know the bottom line is this. If you dwell in peace, you will be able to keep serving God and encourage others to keep serving God. But the reason why you can't do that is because you're not dwelling in peace. That's first. That is first. That's the first place you need to dwell in in order to serve God. That's the first place you need to be in. That way you can have others encouraged to serve God. Now, do you want to have peace in your life? That's the first thing that you'll need if you ever want to have worth to serve God. 
You want to be in peace. You want to dwell in peace. That way you can keep serving God. All right, then what's connected to peace? Encouraging others. You know, it's about time that we stop dwelling in our own city, in the millions of other cities of our own Judah. Well, I have my city of refuge, and this is my refuge, so let me stay here. You know, if you get out of your selfish place and think about others and start to encourage other people, think about other people's pains, not yourself. Think about, well, I appreciate the pastor. I appreciate the church members who come up to me and talk to me. It's about time I make an effort to talk to them. Then maybe you might have your heart changed and you might be in peace after that. By always having an attitude, I want to do, uh, I want to do my own thing, my own thing. Then what happens is you're never in peace when you come to church, no matter how many billions of times you come here to church. Because, oh, no one said hi to me. No one greeted me. You know, I have no friends here. Oh, no one around my age. And hey, why don't you get up and say hi and talk to somebody? See, if you were to start to think about others, encouraging others, you'd develop peace yourself. You know, oh, why can't the sister sing it right, right over there? Why can't the brother, uh, why is the brother singing off key? Why don't you encourage others by getting up yourself and singing a special for everybody? Why do you expect others to meet your needs rather than meeting others' needs. No wonder you're never in peace after many months and years in this church. Wow. Okay. You know why you're not in peace? Because you're not encouraging others. Yeah. Wow. Well, how does that work? Well, I have this excuse and I have this reason. Why does God want me to do it this way? Why is our church going through a hard time? Why won't God meet my need? I don't know, but stop racking your brain and figuring out why God, why God this. Just know this. Peace is connected if you encourage others. That's, That's it. Simple. Do I need to pull up a 200-page empirical evidence document from scientists to convince you? You don't need to know why. You don't need to feel something to be convinced. Just know this. Stop figuring it out and realize peace is simply connected when you encourage other people. Now do it. Go to the city of peace. Encourage other people and you will dwell in peace. You can only dwell in peace when you encourage other people. But you're like, oh, my problem is so hard. Please pray for me. And your prayer request goes five to ten minutes long. Hey, why don't you instead stop that and start praying five to ten minutes for the other person? Amen. Then you might dwell in peace after that. Wow. Yeah, uh, well, I want to go to the city of Beersheba. Seven wells of water right there. That's what it means. I want to drink. I want to water. Oh, you know, give me more revival meetings. Oh, Pastor Kim, the, the sermon was good, but, you know, it didn't really reach my heart. And then you get a new speaker with a new message, so it gives you a new flavor of water, and you go, man, that tastes good, that refreshes my spirit. But you're so used to those new preachers now, and then you get seven wells of water, you get Beersheba, and you're like, I hear seven preachers in a blowout, but I'm just too tired, and, you know, the preaching was not that good, and, hey, you know, why stop sitting in your own city, give me water, give me water, why don't you give others a water to drink? And then maybe you'll finally dwell in peace. You expect the blowout to keep meeting your need, a revival meeting, meeting your need. Pastor Kim has to set up something. People have to give more money, bring the better speaker, even a better speaker. Pastor Kim has to work harder in a message. We get eight preachers here, and they could do a better job. You keep thinking, you keep thinking. Hey, why don't you stop whining? Get out of your selfish city. Go to the city of peace. Start encouraging other people. Why don't you try and preach? Why don't you try to open in your ears and hear the word of God and get a blessing. Why don't you encourage the other pr preacher and thank them for the preaching that they were able to give to you. And then maybe you'll finally dwell in peace. But you'll never dwell in peace when you expect others to give to you. Guarantee, period, period. Sit right there where you are, just like what you're doing now, and you'll never get peace. Give me, pastor. No, preach something harder. Preach something better. No, I'm not convicted yet. No, the, you know, it's so stuffy, the room. Hey, the people didn't say hi to me. I don't get what I want in this church. There are other churches who give better offers. You know, the public school has something better. The world has something better. You know, I want to go back to my video games and TV. Hey, stop being selfish. Get out of your seat and start ministering to other people. Then you'll finally get peace. But I promise you this, expecting others to give to you, you never get peace. Never, ever. Never. 
ever. I don't know how it works, but all I know is this, and I can't explain it to you, I can't convince you with all the reasons and examples, but I do know this, peace is connected when you encourage others. That's good. Now, you want to dwell in peace? Then start encouraging other people first. And when I preach this message, I guarantee this, some people here might think about, yeah, that's right, Pastor, amen. I remember that so-and-so didn't come and encourage me on that, didn't support me on this, didn't pray for me on this, and that so-and-so always whined to me about his or her problems. And, no, 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 you! You! You have to think about yourself. That's right, I need to encourage that other person. Not so-and-so needs to hear so they can encourage, what, me? You got that problem again. That's why you're not in peace. You will get peace, though, if you think about Yes, pastor, that's right. There are things I need to work on more to encourage others. That's my weakness. I need Amen. to do this more for other people. That's my weakness. That's why I still can't get over that fight with that brother and sister in Christ, and there's that tension. I need to get over this, and I need to do this and this and this, and you will finally dwell in peace. Yes. I can't explain it. I can't convince you with that. I can't give a great illustration that will convince you. I don't know, but all I know is peace is connected when you encourage others finally. Yeah. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. Now take it or leave it. That's good. And the rest of this message will finally, you'll feel peace when this preaching keeps going into your heart. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you don't get this step down, the rest of this message will not give you peace. Yeah. Okay. What helps me immensely as a pastor out of my own sob, sorry state is to think about other people's pain other people's needs, other people who are going through harder times than I do, other people that I uh, can give them joy, it'll give me joy. And then I develop peace after that. First, first is this city. First. Don't go to your city of refuge. Don't get your city of seven wells of water to satisfy you. Why not live in the city of peace? Don't you want that? then encourage other people. Notice in verse 4, the portion of the priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. So if these Jews were able to give a portion to the priests, then the priests can be encouraged to keep ministering to them. Well, why should I uh, give to God's ministers? So that they can minister to you. Don't you want that? 1 Corinthians 9, go to 1 Corinthians 9. Paul recognized that. That's why he brought up the example of these priests who are given something, who are given a portion. So Paul says that's why us preachers are applicable as well. You need to give something to us preachers so that we can keep ministering to you. Why should I give a portion to God's preachers? It's because that way they can keep spiritually feeding you. And I know that's what you came here for. That's what you put your money in the offering plate for. That's what I even get my own pay for. That's the reason why you sacrificed your time to come here. Why? You want to be spiritually fed. You want to be spiritually ministered to, don't you? If you want that, that's why it's worth it to give the portion to God's preachers so they can be encouraged to keep spiritually feeding you. But think about it, if that preacher is discouraged, how can he successfully feed you well? If that preacher gets down, how can that preacher do a good job to help you grow? See that? That's why it's so, so important to encourage God's preacher. That way he can keep spiritually feeding you so well that you come out all spoiled. And that's what you want. You want to be fed so fast. You want to be satisfied. I know each and every one of you want to come here on Sunday satisfied and leave this building satisfied. Yeah. I got my spiritual plate. That's why you need to encourage God's preachers. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Bible says in verse 13, do ye not know that they which minister about holy things, yeah. see, God's uh, priests in the Old Testament, live of the things of the temple. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. 
Verse 11, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? When's the last time that you gave a portion that would encourage the preacher? That way they can keep spiritually feeding you. You know what I want when I uh, have our guest speakers here? I want to make sure I give them a good portion. That's right. Why? Because I want that revival meaning to really be a revival. Yeah. I came here for my sermon's worth, and by the grace of God, I want to hear something that I will be satisfied with. So I am going to treat every guest preacher that comes here so well so that they can be encouraged to preach such a powerful yes. yeah. sermon. Why do you think that uh, I will thank them? Why do you think that I will be helpful to them? Why do you think that I will uh, cheer them up in the preaching? It's because I want them to keep preach, be motivated and encouraged to preach even better. Even better. So that they can spiritually feed me. That's why it's so important to do that. When's the last time you encourage God's preacher so that they can keep feeding you? But if you don't do that, the preacher becomes weaker and discouraged and pretty soon you'll notice that in the teaching, in the preaching, the discipleship and fellowship and even counseling personal problems you desperately need help with. It's so important. You got to encourage God's preacher. Uh, notice right here at verse 4 is that the portion of the priest. So priest does not just simply mean some special uh, leader in the church. The Bible says we're all priests of God. So it's not just giving a portion to God's church leaders. What about your fellow brother and sister in Christ? Are we not all priests? Yeah. Uh, when's the last time you encouraged that brother and sister in Christ? Thank you so much for coming to church. When's the last time you encouraged that brother and sister in Christ? That food was real good. When's the last time you encouraged that brother and sister in Christ? Hey, uh, I got away from the world. I want to encourage you to get away from that world too. When's the last time you encouraged that brother and sister in Christ? Hey, you can get victory over that sin. Just get your tail to church. Come on. Yeah. When's the last time you encouraged that brother and sister in Christ and followed up with them and say, hey, I'm praying for you? When's the last time you encouraged your brother or sister in Christ and told them, hey, I'm praying for you? Hey, when is the last time you, have, you actually prayed for them? Okay. When's the last time you encouraged your brother and sister in Christ? You might say, why should I? Because they're priests too. Come on. And they do spiritually minister to you. That's right. Yes. They spiritually minister to you just by being with them fellowshipping with them, laughing with them, crying together through trials, praying together. They go through a struggle that coincidentally matches your struggle. Right. That's why you want to encourage them. Why? So that they can spiritually minister to you. Amen. But if you, don't spiritually, if you don't encourage them, how can they minister to you? They'll have a frowny face. They'll just have a, they'll just have a bored look on their face. They'll just come out of duty, and there's no life and it'll negatively affect you, and you end up the same way too. Yeah. Yep. You don't like that. You want them to spiritually minister to you. You want them to say, hey, I'm so glad you're going street preaching. I'm going to go along with you. Keep up the good work. Let's go track passing together. Well, wouldn't that encourage you in return to pass out tracks to go street preaching? It does. It's an effect. They spiritually minister to you. Why should I encourage my fellow brother and sister in Christ? So that they can encourage you. That's why. If you want to be spiritually fed, you want to be encouraged, you need to encourage the other person. And if you're thinking in your mind, that's right, Pastor, I, don't, I encourage those people, but they haven't encouraged me. Ah, you're back to the same point, number one. That's why you're not in peace. Because you're still stuck in your city of what? My refuge. Yes. My Hebron. My seven wells of water that I'm supposed to drink and I don't get it. My Beersheba. You're not in Jerusalem. Okay. You want peace? You need to encourage others. Don't think about, yeah, that's right, pastor. They're supposed to encourage me. See, the devil warped your mind again. And if you're saying amen and you're agreeing because other people aren't encouraging other people rather than thinking about yourself not encouraging other people, you got a problem. You got to think about yourself right here. You got to think about that. Because if you have that mindset, that's right, other people should encourage other people. I don't get that. Then I guarantee you this, you're not the only one thinking that. Everybody else in that room, someone sitting next to you is thinking that too. 
and we will never have a peaceful church service. You know, another thing that I noticed right here at verse 4, it's not just the priest. It says, and the Levites. You notice that, Levites? What are Levites? Priests only allow Levites. Levites can become priests. All priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. Why is that? Because Levites are an inferior category. Basically, they have to go through the Levites training. Then after that, they become a priest. So a Levite is an inferior category next to the priest. You know what you got to do? You got to give a portion to not just the priests, but Levites. You might, uh, I know that you have your brother and sister in Christ who may be that priest who spiritually feeds you. Your pastor, who is that priest who spiritually feeds you, but obviously you don't think about so-and-so sitting behind you or so-and-so that you hardly talk to, so-and-so that kind of is you're tense with or you, don't feel, you feel indifferent toward. You don't think about that Levite there. Yeah, so you don't encourage that Levite. That's why that person never got a follow-up from any one of you priests over here. And that's why they don't come to church anymore. That's why they fall out. Why? Because they're not a priest. They're a Levite. They're a Levite. You need to give a portion to the Levites so that they can be encouraged. Yes. To what? Minister to you. Yes. Unbelievable, right? I know you don't believe it. No, not that Levite. That Levite's hopeless. Keeps messing up in sin. And, you know, that person, uh, I, don't, I just, we just have differences. I don't see something in that Levite. Hey, man, look at this passage. Go to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, uh, 29. 2 Chronicles 29. And Chronicles 29. Hezekiah didn't overlook the Levites. He realized that, hey, these people are needed. I need to encourage them too because they do spiritually minister to me. They do encourage me in return. That's why I need to encourage the Levites. You might say, really? Look at 2 Chronicles 29. Notice that they were offering sacrifices in verse 33. And the consecrated things, Hezekiah is offering them, were 600 oxen and 3,000 sheep. But the priests were what? Too few, so that they could not flay all the burnt offerings. Wherefore, their brethren, the Levites, did help them till the work was ended. And until, look at this, the other priests has sanctified themselves. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. You get that? These inferior Levites were the ones who were flaying all the sacrifices who uh, sanctified themselves more than the priests. And that's why Hezekiah said, man, they, they should get a portion. I got to encourage them too. I know they're not priests in my level, but, and they're a Levite, but I want them to be encouraged to keep serving God too. Because, they did, because they're ministering to me. They're flaying all the sacrifices. They're sanctifying themselves more than the priests. You know what you are? You know what's sad? I'll tell you what's sad. You're probably that priest because you preached here before. Because pastor relied on you on a lot of things. He asked me to do all these five different chores in the church. Oh, people have come to me for prayer and counseling. And you're that priest who did not sanctify himself or herself or could flay the sacrifice when the pastor said and the people needed you and said, hey, can you help me out with this one? And you couldn't, but it was that inferior Levite that did minister to that person. That was there for that person. That helped out that person where you weren't. Who's the Levite here, huh, in your mind? Hey, priest, when's the last time that, oh, I'm a priest. I'm a priest. So I helped out the pastor. He relied on me. Oh, what about that time of need when you weren't there? And then it was a Levite. You couldn't have, you couldn't have thought. You didn't thought about that was there for that pastor. That was there for that church member. I guarantee you this. Some of these people here, including myself, can tell you Levites who were there at our very time of need that the priest wasn't there for. 
It was that Levite who said, thank you for that sermon. It was that Levite that encouraged the altar calls by coming. But you can't. You're a priest, huh? You're too good. You've done enough for the Lord. You're a priest. I'm not inferior like that Levite. But the Levite realized, yeah, it's an inferior position I have. So I have a lot of zeal. There's a lot of makeup I want to do. It was that Levite who signed up the volunteer sheet. It was that Levite who encouraged that brother and sister, who talked to that brother and sister when you, the priest, didn't. It was a Levite who talked and ministered to that person. You're that priest, huh? Are you that priest? Yeah, it, it's that Levite that you look down upon that you will be surprised and probably you're looking at is slaying the sacrifice and doing your job, buddy, your work. It was the Levite that was there early in church when you, the priest, weren't there early in church to fill up the seats. That was there to welcome the newcomer. It was a Levite, not you, the priest. It was a Levite that was there to help out with the instrument, with cleaning up, with setting up things, cleaning the bathroom, that was there right after late hours in the church to clean up. It was a Levite, not you, the priest. It was a Levite that was there, not you. How can you think that, oh, I'm a priest, so I've done my job for the day? That's probably what those priests were thinking. I'm a priest. I've done my job for the day, so I don't need to flay the sacrifice on the altar. But the Levite is the one who thinks, I haven't done enough. I need to flay the sacrifice on the altar. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about right here? Yeah. That's, why you need to, uh, that's why you need to give a portion to Levites, inferiors. Why? So that they can be encouraged yeah. to flay the sacrifice where you, the priest, missed out and weren't there for, was unavailable, couldn't do. That's why it's so important to see these Levites Levites, whether you believe it or not, Levites are the ones who can make up most of the numbers in the seats in the church. They can build up and fill up a house. Whether you like it or not, it's those Levites. So they need to be encouraged to keep filling up the seats and the pews, huh? Yeah, I know. You're a priest. You preached a great sermon. People relied on you for counseling. That's your problem. And that's the reason why there were duties and areas you failed that a Levite had to pick up your slack, fella. 2 Chronicles chapter 31, and then notice right here in verse 5. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey. Notice right here in verse 6 that they brought the tithe of oxen and sheep. What is the portion that's given to God's people, the priests? We're all priests, amen? So what is it that you should give to them that they can be encouraged to serve God? What's their portion? First fruits. First fruits. Uh, think about this. Think about this. The first, the very first thing in your mind when you wake up, are you thinking about what can I do to be a blessing to the brother and sister in Christ? Is that the first thing in your mind? Is it the first thing in your mind that as soon as you come to this church, what's the first, what can I do to find some brother or sister in need and be there for them? Are you that? Or are you the one sitting down and said, give me, give me. I expect something, give me... No, 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 no. When's the last time you went there to give something to the other person? Is that the first thing in your mind when you come to church? When we get our pay, what's the first thing on our mind? Oh, now I can use this for vacation and... Or is it the ministry? How about God's people right here? That way we can have a better meeting. That way we can make this building look a little better. That way we can support even more missionaries. Is that the first thing in your mind? First fruits is given to the priest so they can be encouraged to serve God. First, uh, if they see that, 
where, hey, my priority is in God's people, the church right here. That's the first thing. Well, you know, I got to take care of my wife, my children, my family, and stuff like that. And then because of that, that became our excuse where we don't give the portion to God's people because they're not first fruit. Now, I want to clarify this that way there's no misunderstanding. Myself as a pastor, my, uh, my wife next to Jesus Christ is the most important person that I commit my time and schedule, my family, all right, next to Jesus Christ, not the people here. They're the first thing next to Jesus Christ. Okay, then, Pastor, why did you say that, hey, shouldn't the God's people, God's ministry be the first fruit or the first thing in our minds? Well, the first fruit, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians ch chapter 15, is who? Christ. Christ, the first fruits. Now, shouldn't Christ be above your wife, your children, your family? Yes. yes. If Christ is number one in your priority, and when you get that pay, and the first thing, listen, the first thing on your mind is not your family for a good vacation, but the first thing in your mind is Jesus Christ. What can I do? If you make Jesus Christ number one, the first thing, he'll filter out and show you the priorities, how, how to use that money. He'll show you, yeah, you, can, you need to use that for family vacation, but don't forget to use that other portion for God's people and ministry. Yeah. Right. There are times that does happen, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 But in our mind, it's just my son, my daughter, my wife, my family, my, 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 see, it's my. It's not really family, it's actually me. My, 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 my. But if we put Jesus Christ, he'll set the priorities for you. Yes. Yes. So Christ is the first fruits. So think about it. If Christ is the first fruits, and you give something where Christ is first fruits, Christ is priority number one, don't you think that when you give the first fruits, which is Christ, it will encourage other people? Basically, what I'm saying is you can give more to encourage other people, but perhaps the reason why you're not doing that is because you used your family, you used your work, you used your health, you used other excuses as your excuse rather than Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ was above your health, your family, your everything, he'll set up the priorities for you. Don't worry about your health and family and other stuff. But at the same time, I guarantee you this. If you put Christ as first fruits, you'll give more to others. You might say, why would I give more to others? Because they're the body of Christ. If Christ is first fruits, he does have a priority over his body, which is God's people here. Is this making any sense to you? The point is, is that if you get your your pay, if you get your schedule, your time, your labor, your sacrifice, I'm not nonchalantly saying that the first thing in your mind is, oh, brother and sister so-and-so in the church. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying the first thing on your mind should be Jesus Christ. Yeah. And if it's Jesus Christ and you seriously spend time praying to him and you seriously know what the Holy Spirit wants, he'll set up the priority for you about family, health, and all that. And at the same time, he somehow does it where you give more to God's people. Is, does that make any sense to you? Let me make it even more basic. If you make Christ priority, you do give more to others. You do give more to others and clear up priorities. That's what happens. If Christ is your first fruits, do you, is that the first thing in your time, your trial, your prayer, your schedule. If Christ ain't first fruits, that's why you haven't been encouraging others. But all you have to do is make Christ priority number one, and automatically you will give more to others and encourage them. What's also given, not just uh, first fruits right here, 1 Corinthians 15, Christ is the first fruits, we know that, but also it says, and, oh God, do you have to add something on top of that one? Yeah, and tithe. Well, I do tithe my money, Pastor. I give a tenth of what I got. No, no, that's not what tithe is. 
You know what tithe is right here? The verse 5, it says the tithe of what? All things. Not just your pay. Your time. Yes. Your talent. Yes. Your very presence. Yes. Your being there. Your efforts. Anything that you got in your home, at least have you thought about a tenth of that? I give to the Lord's work to incur so that people can be encouraged. Think about it. I mean, think about this. If uh, we had about, let's say, a thousand people and they did give a tenth of their money, don't you think that everybody in the church would be even more encouraged? Because what happens? They get more things through more money. And then the people, they get more encouraged with, oh, wow, we get finally better air, we finally got air conditioning in the church. We finally have a new carpet. This carpet was getting filthy. Finally, we're getting a nice seats. Finally, we're getting a good kitchen. Finally, that's what we can support more missionaries. Finally, we can use this thing for even our own fellowship to encourage each other. Finally, that's what happened. You encourage each other more. If everyone were to give, if like a thousand people gave a tenth of their money, but think about a thousand people, or nay, let's put 40 people who gave a tenth of what, uh, a tenth of their job, a tenth of their labor, work effort. Right. Let me make it, let me make it more eye-opening. Throughout 24 hours that one day, can't you give even a tenth of that day for others? You know what people do? They give less than a tithe. I come Sunday main service, I've done my part. That's less than a tenth. I promise you, I promise you this. Some of you might agree when you notice this. If you give at least a tenth to God's work to encourage other people, your life dramatically changes. And God does help here and there at times. Think about it. Even in just prayer and Bible reading, you're not with the church. You're not fellowshipping with them. You're not in a Zoom. You're all by yourself just reading the Bible and praying. In that time that you're spending with God, a tenth, okay, of your day, a tenth of 24 hours, during that time, imagine if you prayed for all those brothers and sisters in Christ. You had verses there in your Bible reading that you took that you don't just keep for yourself, but you can practice it outwardly to bless others. Imagine how much more you can encourage others. You know what I do every day of my life? I have to think about what can I do to bless God's people? What can I do to bless God's people? Even if I'm taking a vacation by myself or a break by myself, I take that to think about I need my health my joy, my energy, so I can come back fresh to bless God's people. Do you understand that? The point is, is that the first fruits and a tenth of our effort and time and what we do is concentrated to encourage other people. It will be life transforming. Think about how much you've been spending your time, huh? Or how much time you've wasted. How much effort you used or how much effort you wasted? I guarantee you this with all of us here. A huge percentage, if not 90% of our things are spent for us. We use health, family, you know, well-being and job work as an excuse. It's more so of me. Me, 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 me. Because if God took away all those excuses... I wonder how much is still spent upon me, 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 with a different excuse. Notice right here that at verse 7, verse 7, in the third month they began to lay the foundation of the heaps and finish them in the seventh month. Okay, you know that uh, majority of modern Bible versions, they get rid of the word the foundation, you know that? Majority of modern Bible versions. New King James also gets rid of that. 
It just says they began to lay the heaps and finished in the seventh month. They got rid of the word foundation. Isn't the foundation important right here? Because for the Christian, no other man can lay a foundation, but Jesus Christ is our foundation. It's so important to have a foundation. What's going on here? They're laying heaps, but when they lay these heaps, it's not just starting and finishing like other modern Bibles would show you. It's I'm laying the heap, I'm starting this heap so it can lay a foundation. What does foundation mean? It's a good groundwork where other stuff can be built upon it. You know how you should give to God's people, to the priests, so that you can encourage them to serve God? Are you laying a foundation? Not just giving uh, heaps. No, no, a heap that lays a foundation. Why? Well, I've done my part, you know, pastor. I've signed the sheet. You know, I've fellowship. I've done... No, 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 no. Are those things... Those things are good, don't get me wrong, but do you really use those things as a foundation? Okay. That something can be built upon that. It's one, difference to, it's, it's, a, it's one difference to just say hi to a person versus I'm going to say hi to this person so that it can build upon that a more close fellowship with that other person. It's a difference to say just hi to the person versus I'll say hi to that person so that other brethren, until other brethren can come, and say hi to that person too. A foundation, it gives a chain reaction, see? You do something that causes a chain reaction where things build upon each other. Why do you think pastor has monthly fellowship? Just because? Just because people ask for fellowship? Or is it intended to lay a foundation where maybe the people can bond closer and maybe they can be more encouraged to come to church after that? Maybe they'll be encouraged to participate in more services after that. Maybe someone might even get saved because of that, because they finally get to know the people through that fellowship. You ever thought about that? What's the intention of the offering? Because the Bible says so, so I'm just supposed to do it. No, no, no. It lays a, do you give so that it can lay a foundation? So that we can probably use it to get tech to minister to more people. We can use this to, hey, bring more preachers to our revival meeting. Yeah. We can use this to support more missionaries. It starts a chain reaction. I give so that other people can give. Why do you come on the altar? Maybe. Why do I shout amen? Maybe it causes a chain reaction where other people can come on the altar, where other people can shout for the Lord. I'm not saying to deliberately do that. Uh, obviously, you have to do it sincerely yourself, all right, and not care what other people think. But the problem is this. The problem is a lot of the things that we do, we have to start doing them with the intention that can lay a foundation that it can build. When it starts building, it gets better. Why should I do something that can build? Because your intention is to encourage other people, not just yourself. Your intention is done to encourage other people, not just yourself. Uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. You have to look at your actions. Why do we do Saturday tracking? Why do we do... Uh, why did all of a sudden Saturday street preaching came up? Why should we stay faithful to Tuesday tracking, Monday uh, campus street preaching and stuff like that? It lays a foundation. And other people can add more days. More people can join. More people can finally grow and get a bone finally to... Witness to people when they haven't before. It causes a chain reaction. It lays a foundation that builds to something more. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Our job, the Bible says in, in verse 11, For other foundation could no man lay than that is lay, which is Jesus Christ, right? That's why we have to have that foundation set on Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. You know what the point of verse 10 is? When Paul lays a foundation, people can just start building on top of that. 
And Paul said, as a wise master builder. See, when you do these things, are you doing it wisely? You can do things for the Lord that are not wise and does not encourage people to follow the chain reaction. Let's go street preaching and you make yourself look like a jerk. That won't encourage others to follow your foundation and build upon it. You know, making yourself look like a fool and disrupting church service is not going to cause a chain reaction of other people where they're going to join you in serving and glorifying God. You need to do things that are wise. Why? Why should I? Why should I? So that it can cause a chain reaction where people can be encouraged to build upon that and follow your example. Zeal, labor, efforts done for the Lord must not be, be done because of me, how I feel, how I want to do it, how I feel, how I want to do it. See, that's your problem, you know. You're, you're not thinking of others again. Think of others. How you can encourage them to join church, to grow in Bible-believing truth, to study the Word of God, to separate from sin. If you were to finally do things wisely, that is a foundation that other people can build upon. Think about everything you've done in this church. Is it in vain? Is it not wise? Is it unwise? Has it caused more people to turn away rather than draw them in to build upon it? Do you have a chain reaction following you? You're by yourself, right? You're singing just Jesus and me all the time. And you think you're so spiritual. Go to 2 Chronicles 31. 2 Chronicles 31. The Bible says in verse 8, And when Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Uh, notice right here that Hezekiah and the people, when they saw the heaps, they made sure to... Bless God, and then also the people. You know, um, they weren't like today's church members where they see the heaps, right? Where they see the heaps, where they were encouraged with the things of the Lord. You've given. Uh, here are brethren who's given you a heap. Brethren who have given you a heap where you can be encouraged to serve God. And instead, you're thinking, well, that should be expected. Well, that could be better. Well, this is normal. I just come in Sunday and that's it. No, when's the last time you said thank you? When's the last time you thanked the Lord for a good Sunday meeting? You think that God's going to keep this heap going if you never even thank him? You think the people in this room are going to keep growing the heap if you don't even thank them? I'll tell you what you are. Maybe this is some of you. If, you. if you haven't thanked them, I know what you're doing. Go to Romans 1. I know what you're doing, Romans 1. You know what happens with, uh, when people don't thank? What happens then is when people get, keep giving you heaps and heaps of good things that should encourage you, that would motivate anybody to serve God I mean, we got three hymn books for crying out loud. We got a Galora song, songs that even other Christians have not sung before. What a blessing. But you can get heaps of those and still not be moved. Why? What happened? What happened? You weren't thankful. Instead, it's like, oh, here we go again, the same song. Instead, it's like, oh, I already know the next word, so yeah, I'm used to the uh, amen part on this part. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard that song, so uh, it was good before, but not now. Wow. See, not, uh, not the thankful attitude like before. At the beginning when you got the song, man, these are good words, man. Good th that appreciation's gone. What happens when appreciation is gone? Imaginations and thoughts darken. When you forget to thank the heap that's given to you, the foolish heart, the heart runs foolishly. The imagination runs empty in the dark void thinking about, well, it's not as good as before. 
The imagination runs in the dark void with the foolish heart going, well, it could be better. The imagination runs wild in the dark void saying, well, yeah, I know the, 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 the good part that the pastor's preaching. I heard that before. It's not going to convict me. The imagination's going to run in the dark void and the foolish heart will go, oh, I'm going through a trial. No matter how great this revival meeting is, oh, this trial is just too painful. That's what happens when you don't have that thankful attitude for the heap that's given to you. The imagination runs wild in the dark void and the heart feels foolish emotions. You know one thing I learned? I can keep... I can keep amping up my sermon and I can preach it better and better, gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder. But I guarantee you this, you can still walk out of this message still struggling with the same old depression. Why? Why is that? There wasn't thankfulness right there. There wasn't thankfulness in the sermon. Man, that's fresh. That's good. Something that I can apply in my life. It's... Uh, Without that thankful attitude, the imagination runs in the dark void. Oh, that's good, but still. You don't believe me? Go to Romans 1. Romans 1, verse 21. Be verse 21. Because that when they knew God, see, you, you know God. You know the preaching. You know the preacher. You know the hymns. You know all the heap that God has given to you. You know they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. See, when you don't bless God, bless the people for giving you the heaps, when you don't give glory for that, you don't give thanks, what happens? But became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. The imagine, if you don't have thankfulness running in your heart and mind, listen, if you don't have thankfulness running in your heart and mind with this heap that God has given to you, when the chances are people don't have the heap that you got today, if you don't have that thankfulness running in your heart and mind right now, I know what's running in your heart and mind right now. Your imagination running in the dark void. Like, oh yeah, I get it, but oh, the trial is so great and you don't understand and Oh, uh, I'm used to, I already heard that before, and that's what happens. Go back to 2 Chronicles 31. 2 Chronicles 31. When I preach like this, it's not, uh, <laughs> how many of you have thought about, man, how did pastor know what I was going through? <laughs> I, I know people think like that. But if you preach, uh, you can ask our preachers and other people here, if you've been here for a while, if you preached here for a while, that's not the case. A lot of times this preaching is done because God shows the preacher something, yep. and you'd be surprised, this preaching comes out because he's talking about himself too. Yep. Why? What I go through is what you're going through right now. Yeah. Go to verse 9. Then Hezekiah questioned with the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him. Okay, uh, look, at verse 8, you should be thankful for the heap, Hezekiah. But why would he dare, at verse 9, question about the heap? I mean, isn't it, uh, bless God for this heap. Let's be happy. No, no, no. He questioned it too after that. So what is all this heap? As, is this really good? What are we going to do about this heap? You know, what he, you know what he thought? He realized that, hey, this is good. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for what God has given to me, but I'm not going to be satisfied and think that I did a good job with this heap. I want to question it and ask that brother and sister in Christ, how was that heap? You know what the thing is, is that it's easy for you to think, I've done my part, I've given a heap, a heap load for the brother and sister in Christ. Well, what about if you were to ask them? And I wonder how their answer would be. Maybe, you're just annoying me, leave me alone. Maybe is I'm glad you're helpful, but you're being more of a burden. Maybe it's, hey, uh, I appreciate your zeal for the Lord, but you're getting rid of my zeal for the Lord with your unwise zeal. Maybe it's, 
know what the problem with us is? We think we give a heap load and, oh, it's a good job, I've already given it. No, 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 why don't you, what would that brother and sister in Christ answer it if you were to question it? You know what I think? Oh, I've done a good job in preaching. I've done a good job in pastoring. I've done a good job in teaching. No, 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 no. What I go in my heart is I question it on how did, it, did that brother and sister in Christ, if I were to really question them, were they truly ministered to? Were they truly ministered to? A pastor's position is not about selfishness or what he thinks is best all the time. It's about people. It's about sheep. Ministering to sheep. We can't expect the pastor to do everything perfectly, and I get it. And people should stop quitting and whi should stop whining. Uh, people should stop whining about the imperfections of a pastor. Look, I get that, okay? We'll never do anything A+. Plus. But the point is, is that the problem is the reason why we're not encouraging other people is because we think we got a very good heap for them, but it's not a heap load of good. It's probably a heap load of trouble. It's probably a heap load of burden. It's probably a heap load of vain. And that's why wives and husbands fight all the time. I did this for you. I've done this heap load for you. I've done this heap load for you. Why aren't you thankful and stuff like that? Hey, 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 hey. What if you were to question them on your heap load? Maybe you might get a different answer. And you'd realize how selfish you were in using that heap load. And pharisaical, I've done my part. I've done my heap load for the pastor. Oh, yeah? Then what if it was question? Okay. I've done my heap load for the church member right there. What if it was question? How would they answer? Look at verse 10. Verse 10. What's the point of this message so far? Encouraging each other to serve God. If you want to do a good job of that, you need to make sure your heap is done right. Not just a tenth or the first fruit. It's got to be done right. Notice in verse 10, the Bible says, And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have left plenty. For the Lord hath blessed his people, and that which is left is this great store. Then Hezekiah commanded to prepare chambers in the house of the Lord, and they prepared them. Okay, so Azariah the chief priest is saying, we got a huge load of this heap, so we don't know what to do with them. And Hezekiah says, okay, we're going to go to the chambers of the temple, because chambers, for some of you who didn't know, why did Hezekiah choose the chambers in the temple? They were originally tended as storage for all the heaps, for the treasures. That's why. So Hezekiah say, let's put them in the chambers of the temple. Well, wait a minute. This is kind of weird. If chambers are intended for storage for the heaps, dull question, why didn't they put it there to begin with? Why did the verse say Hezekiah had to prepare the chambers? What's this heap lying outside? Well, we got too much. We don't know where to put it. Hey, fool, there's a chamber in there. Why don't we just put it inside there? It wasn't that simple. They had to prepare the chamber. So you might go, what's going on over here then, pastor? Why couldn't they just put in the chamber to begin with? Why did they have to prepare it? Something was in there. Go to 2 Chronicles 29. 2 Chronicles chapter 29. Something was in there. We're going to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 18. Look at verse 18. Uh, we'll, start, uh, we'll look at verse 18. Then they went into Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord. Cleanse? Look at verse 15. And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. Look at verse 16. And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord. You know why they couldn't put those heaps in those chambers? 
It's because there was uncleanness to begin with all that time. There were idols, uncleanness, corruption in the chambers, in the temple. That's why they never put those heaps inside to begin with. That's why the, ne the next two chapters reads, they had to prepare the chamber. Why did they prepare the chamber? It was never prepared for God's heaps to begin with. It was always used for their idolatry and sin. You know what my point is? My point is, is that here's a heap load of God's blessing. And just like that priest, you're, uh, you're not putting in the chamber. You might say, why, why am I not putting in the chamber? Because you got idols in there. Yeah. You never prepared your chamber for the heap, heap of the Lord. And guess what? You got a heap full of blessings. You got your brother and sister in Christ. You got prayers. You got preaching. You got Bible-believing truth. You got certain people here that you could befriend that can help you. You got some opportunities here that you can do that can help you. You got some blessings. And here's a heap full for you every Sunday. And you miss out that opportunity and you let that heap rot outside in the sun. Why? This, I mean, this should... Who would take this heap for granted? Wouldn't you use it? I'll tell you why. Simple. You got those idols in your chambers. Yeah. That's the easy answer. No matter how, listen, no matter how big God blesses your life with even greater and greater heaps, it will never bless you if your chamber has never been cleaned of its oh, idols. And when that flesh is still there, you know, your personality, your weakness, the thing that displeases God is still in there, God can give you a truckload of blessings and you'll still miss out the blessing. You'll let it waste and rot out in the sun. But if you finally clean the idols in your chamber, finally, let's apply the heap inside. You know why the singing never meant anything to you? No matter how much the heap of singing was, you got that bitterness, that depression still inside your chamber. You got that heap full of preaching that should convict and change anybody. But it can't go in there because the idols are still in that chamber. You can't put God's heap of blessing in until you get that dirty stuff out. You can get... I can get the top 10 preachers in the world here. Give you a heap full of good time of a blowout. You still walk out unchanged. You still let it rot, rot. It's been uh, five blowouts and you let it rot out in the sun. A heap full. Because of that chamber, you refuse to clean out. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. If you want to be encouraged and other people to be encouraged, see, that chamber's got to be clean. Otherwise, that heap is rotting. Every, can you imagine this? We are wasting our time. Do you understand that? Us coming here to church, us listening to preaching, us fellowshipping, us bringing food is all a stinking waste of heap outside because it never entered to the chambers of these people here, of our hearts. It never entered our chambers. We still kept bitterness, depression, misery, complaining, whining, and sin inside our chambers. We've all wasted our time today. That's why no one's encouraged here. That's why the person still comes in with a plastic face. The person still comes in unconvicted. The person still uh, doesn't do anything for the Lord. Unconvicted. Let's look at the next part of verse uh, 12. I know I'm over the time. Uh, I appreciate your patience. Um, I believe the Lord want, doesn't want me to ruin this, though. So um, let, let the hour go, okay? Let the hour go. Verse 12, and brought, I'll do my best to wrap up the time, though, okay? I want you to know that. Verse 12, and brought in the offerings and the tithes and the dedicated things faithfully. Now, notice right here that when they brought their heaps, it, uh, they didn't just, the verse did not say, brought in the offering and the tithes and the dedicated things, period. No, it says faithfully. You know what the problem is? People bring their heaps 
but they're not faithful about it. If that verse dropped the word faithfully and it just said they brought in the tithes and the dedicated things, you know what that would mean? That would mean that the previous five verses that you read, I brought the heap, I'm done. No, that's not what the passage is saying. The passage is saying that when they brought in the heap, they brought it faithfully. Because it's brought consistently, that huge pile, they're able to build chambers. But they cannot build those chambers if that heap is not brought faithfully. People give it their all that they've got, a heap full of all that they got, and they're done. I've done my part. I sacrificed. I burned my body at the stake for you, Jesus. Oh, one-time show, huh? You think you're so good, you're so spiritual, because you just rescued somebody's life. You just led a soul to salvation. You preached something that helped somebody's life. You've done something that the pastor relied only you upon. Great. One-time show, though, huh? Oh, why you stop right there, fella? Faithfully. Can I tell you something? This is eye-opening. Faithfulness is more important than the greatest sacrifice you can give to others. Faithfulness to others is greater than the greatest sacrifice you can give to others. Uh, look at right here. They brought a heap of their sacrifice, right? You know what God said? God was sick of it. Go to Hosea 8. I'll just read it for time's sake, okay? Uh, but Hosea 8, 13 through 14. Hosea 8, 13 through 14 reads, They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it. But the Lord accepted them not. Why? He, they brought a truckload of their sacrifices, heaps. But the Lord won't accept it. Why? Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. For Israel hath, what? Forgotten his maker. What does that mean? See, they stopped. They weren't consistent. They weren't faithful. They dropped, neglected God. And that's why no matter how big their heap of sacrifice was to bless God and others, God still rejected it. Is that you? Oh, I've done my heaps here and there. Here and there? No, 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 no. Let's be consistent. Let's be consistent. Let's be honest, too. If you, even though one cup of water per day is not, uh, is not advisable, that is sure better. One, uh, at least one cup of water per day is better than 14 days without water and you drink a whole chug full of gallon of water. Why? Because consistency and faithfulness, no matter how small, is still more prized than the greatest sacrifice when it comes in once in a blue moon. If you're not faithfully ministering to people, encouraging them, you know what 3 John says? 3 John points out right here, when you are not faithful to encourage others, to minister to people, the Bible says in 3 John... Verse 5, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. That verse is saying because you faithfully minister to God's people, God's people aren't taking anything from the lost Gentile world. What happens when you don't faithfully give to others? They take something from the Gentile world. You don't meet them in fellowship, the Gentile world will. You're not going to give them satisfaction and joy? The Gentile, wicked, sinful world, they'll find it over there. You're not going to uh, be there for them? The lost Gentile world, they will turn to all the stinking time. When's the, last time, when's the last time any single body in this room, man, woman, child, teenager, everyone, when's the last time they took nothing, and I mean nothing, from this wicked Gentile world? If you faithfully minister to them. 
if you are faithfully there for them. That's why I said so many times, children are my priority number one in this church right now because I know what they're doing. They don't find satisfaction here. They find satisfaction in the Gentile lost world. And that's uh, the contributing factor is that parents, fathers, mothers, and Bible-believing Christians have failed their part to discipline, to give them joy, to help them. They weren't faithful in that. They just gave it their all in the one Sunday because Pastor Kim held a meeting, a meeting and preached a good sermon to do that, and that was a one-time show. It lasted good only for one Sunday. That was it. But if you're faithful every day, keeping track, doing that, to encourage somebody, they might eventually let go of the Gentile world and take nothing from there to encourage them. Who's encouraging? Who's encouraging these people in this church, huh? Is it the Gentile world or truly you? Go back. My last verse. Thank you for your patience. My last verse. Verse 12 it's, and verse 13, notice names are given. You see that? Names are given. We don't care about names. I don't care about names. You know, I'm going to forget these names. But uh, God cares about these names, Amen. that he would write them in his book. Why? Because each name is an encouragement to the other person. When I look at these names, I'm picturing like uh, if I read verse 12, and brought in the offerings and the tithes and the dedicated things faithfully over which Sean Lawler was ruler and Robert Randall, his brother, was the next and Robert Garcia and Jared Kwong and Florence Kwong and Min Jung Kim and Danielle Seeley and Sheila Randall and and I go through every single name. Yeah. I have in my phone or in a list every single name of the people in the church. So I can pray for them. So I can follow up. So I can try to be there for them. And it reminds me. It reminds me. Because each and every person is important and was an encouragement to me somewhere. When I look at these names, it's an encouragement to me. Think about it. I mean, imagine some of these names, right, that you went soul winning with. You remember? Think about some names in your mind, huh? A Levite and a priest, huh? Think about some of these names where they were there for you when you needed it, where you were both out soul winning together, and it was like the first time going out witnessing to somebody. Remember the joys of every single name where... You know, we're marching around the room singing, Hail to the King we love so well, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Remember these names? You know, when I uh, looked at all the church photos that we went through in the years, I look at all these names and faces. But you know what the sad thing is? It's inevitable, and I'm sad to say, it's a guarantee it's inevitable. Some of those names are no longer there. Think about some of the names here. I guarantee you this. Some of those names will no longer be with you. Can you imagine that? After all the time you prayed for them and helped them and you preached your heart out, you done something you could and can you imagine some of these names never there again look i mean think about the person sitting next to you behind you what if that's a person you'll never see again and you know what it's inevitable it will happen but some of these names too some of these names too you will see them every day with you some of these names will still go street preaching with you. The good news is some of these names will not quit their Christian race. They'll keep traveling with you. Some of these names you can talk about 10 years later after this message. Remember that time where we went through that trial together? Here we still are. Some of these names you might have children together. Some of these names you're going to serve God together. You might preach on the same pulpit together. You might be sisters praying together. Some of these names 
I am happy to say, it is inevitable, will still be here till the day you either die or get raptured to heaven. I challenge you, be one of those names. I challenge you to not let the wickedness of this world, the trials and the pain, the tribulation, or this lost pagan Gentile world steal you from one of these names. I challenge you, each and every one of you names today, to encourage one another and let's go on for Jesus Christ. Every eye bow and every eye shut.